let me tell you a little bit about him. Efraim Surov is an American-born Israeli historian and Nazi hunter who has played a key role in bringing indicted Nazi and fascist war criminals to trial. Surov, the director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center office in Jerusalem, is the coordinator of Nazi war crimes research worldwide for the Wiesenthal Center. So thank you very much for being here with us today. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Rav Yossi, for inviting me. And um, basically, this is a story about my life as a Nazi hunter. And it's an attempt to answer three questions that I keep getting asked. Whenever I tell someone what I do, first of all, they're a little surprised. I mean, it's not the average job of a nice Jewish boy like me from Brooklyn. But um, the question number one is, are there still Nazis out there? Number two, how did you become a Nazi hunter? And number three, how do, you, how do you do your job? In other words, how do you find these people? How do you help bring them to justice, et cetera? Now, what's interesting is that very often after I, after I give a talk to a Jewish audience, and I do that a lot all over the world, people will come over to me and they'll tell me, listen, this is my dream job. You have my dream job. When I, and it's very often children of survivors or, or grandchildren of survivors. And they say, you know, when I was growing up, I wanted to catch those Nazis and torture them and do this and do that, et cetera, et cetera. It's not exactly what I do, but the ironic part of this all is that that was not my fantasy when I was growing up. When I was growing up, my fantasy was to be the first Orthodox Jew to play in the NBA. No one's laughing. Okay, in any event, uh, basketball's loss was Nazi Hunter's gain, and uh, I became a Nazi Hunter. And I want to begin with the story of how I actually became a Nazi Hunter, the, the event that changed my life. Originally, I started out as a graduate student studying the Shoah at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I grew, I grew up in Brooklyn, went to uh, yeshivas, yeshiva, yeshiva high school, yeshiva college, uh, made Aliyah at age 22 after spending a year in Israel. And I started studying at the Hebrew University, studying the, the subject of the Shoah. And uh, after a couple of years, I got a job working for the United States Justice Department. In 1979, the American government set up a special office in the framework of the criminal division of the Justice Department to bring to justice Nazi war criminals who had emigrated to the States and were living in the States. And by this time, it was obvious that the number wasn't dozens and it wasn't hundreds, it was actually thousands of people who had collaborated with the Nazis had emigrated to the United States, posing as innocent refugees. And there were even some people, which I'll explain to you in a minute, who were actually brought by the United States government to the United States for particular reasons. So one group was people who were working on Nazi weapons, like the V2 rockets. Those were very advanced rockets, which were being built in Germany by concentration camp inmates at a camp called Dora. And the Nazis hoped that those missiles, which could hit London and maybe even much further than London, would actually turn the tide of the war. And the Americans and the Russians, neither of them had that kind of advanced technology for these missiles. So basically, after the war, there was like a mad race by both sides of the Cold War, the Russians, the Soviets on the one hand, the, the Americans and the British on the other hand, to find the scientists the engineers and the people who were working on these projects to bring them to their side. And the Americans brought at least 150 engineers and scientists to America, knowing full well that these people had worked for the Nazis, they worked for a victory of the Third Reich, and thousands of concentration camp inmates were killed, being worked to death to produce these rockets. So that was one group. Another group was people from countries that were now behind the Iron Curtain, like Lithuania, Latvia, Ukraine, Poland, Yugoslavia, Romania, uh, and the Americans, 
the, what was called the OSS, which was the forerunner of the CIA, Central Intelligence Agents, Agency, recruited these people because they wanted to send them behind the Iron Curtain to be spies for America. Okay, so those are, those are two groups of people, that's several hundred people, who were brought to the United States even though it was clear that they had collaborated with the Nazis. But the overwhelming majority of the people, of the Nazis who entered, were simply people who lied on their immigration records, on their immigration applications. When they came to, they had to write all the places that they had worked before coming to America. And they just made up all sorts of bubble mices, all sorts of tall tales. And they were asked, did you ever, did you fight against the allies in World War II? They said, of course not. And, and uh, did you ever, uh, were you ever a member of a movement that persecuted people because of their religion, because of their ethnicity? He said, of course not. And at that point in time, we're talking about Eastern Europeans. All these people were from the countries that later became part of the Soviet Union or under communism. And for most people in the beginning, right after the Shoah, the Shoah was Dachau, Buchenwald, Mauthausen, the camps in Germany. They didn't really understand what had happened in Eastern Europe, especially not the mass murders carried out by the killing squads, which were a total of 3,000 Germans and Austrians, but they had help from tens of thousands of Lithuanians, Latvians, Ukrainians, Estonians, by the Russians, etc. So these were the people who were able to sort of slip through the cracks. And only in the 70s did the Americans finally realize that the country was full of these Nazis and they set up this special office. And I was working for them in Israel as a researcher. In any event, in 1985, the uh, Simon Wiesendorf sent in Los Angeles, the people I work for now, sent a letter to the National Archives in the United States asking for any and all information about one Joseph Mengele. Now, I'm sure you all know who Joseph Mengele is. He's the famous, infamous, I should say, doctor who had a clinic in Auschwitz, and he was famous for the experiments that he did. Two, two main experiments. One was he wanted to discover the secret of multiple births. In other words, Germany had suffered huge losses of population during the war. Why should a German woman who's giving birth give birth to one child if we can find a way to make sure she gave birth either to twins or triplets? So any pair of twins, any triplets who arrived in Auschwitz were sent to Mengele's clinic. And they, were, they underwent all sorts of horrible experiments. Many of them, some of them were killed. Many of them suffered the rest of their lives because of what they went through at the hands of Mengele. By the way, there was absolutely no medical basis to the experiments he carried out. And another thing he tried to do was he wanted to see if he could create a situation in which all the children of Aryans, in other words, the people of the Aryan race, the Germans, who were born would have Aryan racial characteristics. Now, you all know what they are, of course. Blonde hair and blue eyes. I don't know if any of you ever saw a picture of Mengele. He had brown hair and brown eyes. But in any event, this is what he's famous for. He also was one of the doctors doing the selections. In other words, when the Jews deported to Auschwitz, got off the train, doctors, 20, 21 or 23 German doctors had to decide whether these people would be sent immediately to be murdered because they were either too young or too old, or they looked ill, or they would be sent to work if they appeared to be healthy enough to do forced labor. Mengele was also one of these doctors. In any event, this is 1985, Mengele has disappeared into thin air. No one knows where he is. So the Wiesendorf Center got an answer from the National Archives, and one of the documents that they got was actually quite shocking. It said it was a letter from an American intelligence officer by the name of Benjamin Gorby, who said that according to an informant, Joseph Mengele, 
had been arrested and released by the U.S. Army near Vienna in late 1946. The letter was dated January 1947. Now, this was absolutely shocking. The Americans had actually captured Mengele and they let him go, one of the most notorious Nazi war criminals, someone you know, who was a symbol of the, of the um, betrayal of the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take to, to heal, heal people, not hurt people. It was, it was absolutely incredible. And they made a whole scandal out of this letter. So the American government made three decisions. William French Smith was the attorney general. He said, number one, the United States is going to start looking for Joseph Mengele. No one knew where he was. He just disappeared into thin air. Two, the Americans would check if Mengele had entered the United States. By this time, everyone knew, and the government certainly, that thousands of Nazi war criminals had come to America posing as innocent refugees. And maybe, who knows, maybe Mengele was actually living in America. And the third investigation was to see whether or not this information that he had been arrested and released by the Americans was indeed true. So the office that I worked for, which was the Office of Special Investigations, was given the third assignment. In other words, they had to carry out an investigation to check, was it true? Did the Americans actually arrest and release Mengele? So the, the assignment that I received was to try and find the informant, try and find the person who had given the information to this uh, counterintelligence officer. And it turns out his name was David Fryman. He was a survivor from the Ludge Ghetto. He was deported to Auschwitz in September of 1944, the last deportations to Auschwitz. And where was he sent in Auschwitz? He, went, he was sent to work in Mengele's clinic. So in other words, this guy knew Mengele. He saw him every day. So that added, you know, sort of veracity. That added, uh, made it seem much more serious. And anyway, how did you find a guy like this? It's now the year 1986, 41 years after the end of World War II. How do you find the survivor of the Holocaust? Well, I did most of my work at Yad Vashem in Israel, in Jerusalem, the Holocaust, Israel, Israeli Holocaust Memorial and archives. And a friend of mine, David Zilberklang, who also works there, suggested that I look into something called the International Tracing Service. Okay, the International Tracing Service was set up by the Red Cross after, at the end of World War II, after World War II. And what was it? In those days, there were no databases. So this was basically a compilation of index cards on people who other people asked about, asked the Red Cross to see what happened to them. In other words, there were millions of people missing. P many people outside of Europe had no idea what happened to their relatives. So who do you turn to? You turn to the Red Cross. And every person about whom there was a request had a, had a card. And every person who wanted to get privileges as a refugee had to register with the Red Cross, and there were 11 million people who were homeless at this point in time, and every one of those people also had a card in this, in this, uh, you know, collection. There were, how many were? It was over 16 million index cards, 3,600 microfilms, and uh, I had to find David Fryman. Well, that's a good place to start, but there was one little hitch. And the hitch was that the material wasn't organized according to a regular alphabet. It was organized according to a phonetic alphabet, which means double letters count as single letters. V and W are considered the same letter. I, J, and Y are considered the same letter. So, as you can imagine, I had, I had no clue about this before I started. It took me about an hour to figure it out. 
And what did I realize when I'm looking at this material and going through it? I see that it's full of non-Jews. I always thought that the material in, in the International Tracing Service was all about Jews. Jews who had been in the Holocaust, who had been murdered in the Holocaust, Jews who were registered, Jews who survived and were registered as refugees. But no, there was a, so many non-Jews listed in this, in this material. And this is very interesting. There was no indication on these cards that any of these people were, was a Nazi or a Nazi collaborator. But it did have the immigration destinations of those people who emigrated out of Europe. In the cases of, in other words, they had the date they sailed, the ship they sailed on, the date they, sail, they sailed, and the ones going to America, and that was a large percentage, it had the first address of theirs in the United States. Now, as I said, the cards didn't say who were the Nazis, but I had other sources, and I said to myself, this is too good to be true. I made it, I decided I'm making a test. I took the names of 49 Lithuanians and Latvians whom I knew were Nazi war criminals from the research I had done for the Office of Special Investigations. And within a matter of minutes, I was able to find what happened to 16 of them. In other words, one third of them. Most of them went to America, some went to Canada, some went to Australia, one or two remained in Germany. Now, why was this important? This was super important because at this point in time, out of all the Anglo-Saxon countries, the only country which had decided that they're going to take legal action against the Nazi war criminals was the United States. And they even set up a special office. And I was working for that office. But Canada was investigating, hadn't made a decision. Australia was investigating, hadn't made a decision. Great Britain and New Zealand didn't have a clue that they even had a problem. Now, while I was working for the Americans, I couldn't really do anything about these other countries. But it was clear to me that with this information, we would be able to flood the other countries that hadn't made a decision yet with names of suspects, proving that these people had emigrated to their country, and in that way, convince them that they too had to decide to take legal action against these people. Now, a couple of explanations. All of the people I'm talking about were Eastern Europeans, Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Croatians, Romanians, Hungarians, Poles, okay? These were the Nazis' helpers in Eastern Europe. Only in Eastern Europe, did collaboration with the Nazis include systematic mass murder, participation in systematic mass murder. You have to remember this. In other words, outside of Eastern Europe, the Nazis also had helpers in France and Belgium and Holland and Italy, Greece, Norway, etc. But those helpers were never asked to murder their own Jews. In those cases, the collaboration, in other words, the first step to the final solution, defining who was a Jew, making the Jews' life miserable, stealing their property and everything, and arresting them, that all took place with the help of the helpers. But the helpers, the help stopped either at the train station or the boats, the harbor, from where these people were sent somewhere else to be murdered by someone else. That somewhere else was Eastern Europe. That someone else was who? the Nazis, helpers, and the Einsatzgruppe and the killing squads in Eastern Europe. So in other words, we're talking about a lot of very, very serious criminals, okay? So I decided that what I'm gonna do is I am gonna quit working for the Americans. I had been the academic director of the Wiesenthal Center when it was opened six years previously, and I'm gonna convince the Wiesenthal Center to start a campaign to convince all of these other countries that they had to prosecute Nazis, and we're gonna prove it to them by starting to flood them with lists of Nazis. And that's exactly what happened. Okay, I started, I convinced the Wiesendorf Center to open an office in Jerusalem. They still hadn't, didn't have an office in Jerusalem. I started churning out the lists. I remember the first list was 40 suspects for Australia, then 
17 for England, 26 for Canada, and it, ultimately thousands of thousands of names of suspects were sent to these countries. And the good news is that Canada in 1987, Australia in 1989, Great Britain in 1991, all passed special laws enabling them to prosecute Nazi war criminals on criminal charges. And without that information, it probably never would have happened. Now, if you're wondering what happened with Mengele, it's a very interesting story. Once America started looking for Joseph Mengele, Israel joined in, Germany joined in, and finally, they, in, they questioned one of the key people in the whole story, a guy by the name of Hans Seidelmeier, who worked for the Mengele family. Mengele family had a very big factory in Bavaria, in Gunzburg, making agricultural equipment. And this guy was a key guy. And it turns out that he was the guy who was the contact with Mengele in South America. You all know that Mengele ran away to South America. Initially to Argentina, where he lived under his own name, or almost his own name, Jose. He called himself Jose Mengele. He worked as a doctor. He was actually an abortionist. And right before Eichmann was caught in Argentina, Mengele escaped, ran away to Paraguay, and later to Brazil. And the Mossad was trying to find him. In 1962, uh, agent of the Mossad, Svi Aroni, actually stood face to face with Mengele in Brazil, but he he reached the, uh, his opinion was that the, that the Mossad could never get the people out alive. In other words, the, their own people, let's say if they, to try and kill Mengele or kidnap him, they would never get out of there alive. And then for all sorts of reasons, they dropped the case. It was never, it was never renewed. But what happened to Mengele in the end? We learned from the documentation in Hans Salomayer's office that guess what? Joseph Mengele died of a stroke swimming in the Atlantic Ocean on February 7th, 1979. In other words, Mengele had died six years before. Now, of course, at the beginning, people weren't sure if the, you know, we, we, we found that the body was found, the, the corpse was found, all the forensic tests were made, and it was clear that his son gave even DNA sample, his son hated his father, uh, and he was anti-Nazi, and uh, it was clear that this was Mengele. But the question that I asked myself in the wake of all this was very simple. Why wasn't this investigation carried out in 1975 or 1965? Listen, to put Mengele on trial would have been one of the most important trials in the history of justice after the Shoah. The guy who betrayed his Hippocratic oath the, 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 uh, he was a PhD, by the way. He's not only a medical doctor, he's also a PhD in anthropology. And, and in other words, the, the uh, betrayal of the intellectuals, in other words, science in the service of mass murder, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what would have happened. And the answer is very simple. Lack of political will. Turns out that the Germans, I think, had a good idea where he was. No political will to, to catch him. And only when the Americans started looking, so Israel woke up and the Germans woke up and they did what they should have done years before and we missed the opportunity. So to be perfectly honest, if you ask me what was the biggest obstacle I faced in 40 years of Nazi hunting, the lack of political will. And you see it across the board. Why, won't, why don't countries want to prosecute today, let's say? Why don't countries want to prosecute Nazi war criminals, 90-year-old Nazis? Very simple, because they, they know that all they have to do is ignore nudniks like me and the Wiesendorf Center, and the guys will die. They'll die. It'll spare them the embarrassment. It'll spare them the, the balagan and the whole chaos and the bad publicity, and they'll get away with it. So this is one of the major, major um, obstacles that we have to overcome. And sometimes we do, we succeed, but not, but not every time. I want to tell you two more quick stories. The most important Nazi I helped bring to justice was the last living concentration camp commander, a man who was the commander of a camp called Yasenovats. Now, I would doubt if any of you have ever heard of it because it's not in Poland. It's not considered a death camp. 
but it's a camp in which at least 100,000 people were murdered. Individually murdered by bullets, knives, swords, grenades, you name it, in the most horrific way imaginable by a fascist group from Croatia called Ustasha. So just a little, a little background. 1941 and April 41, the Nazis and the Italians uh, occupy Yugoslavia. They cut the country up into different parts, one of which was called the independent state of Croatia. So Croatia had not been independent for 900 years. The country was turned over to the Nazis allies in Croatia, who were the Ustasha, who were anti-Serb, anti-Semitic, anti-Roma, anti their political opponents. And as soon as they took over in April of 41, they built concentration camps all over the country, the largest of which was Yasenovac. And Yasenovac was notorious for the cruelty of the guards. They even invented a special dagger that made murder more painful to the victims. And they called it a Serb killer. So the victims of Yasenovac were mostly Serbs, 18,000 Jews, thousands of Roma, and Croatians, Catholics like themselves, who were politically against the fascists, and at least 100,000 people. Now, after the, uh, after the war, a lot of the Croatians were able to escape to Argentina. And the reason why was the following. I don't know how many of you have heard of the rat lines. The rat lines were the escape networks of many important Nazi war criminals. Mengele, Eichmann, Schwamberger, a lot of them. And it was like a network that was run by an Austrian bishop called Alius Hudel, who was head of a seminary in Rome. And his assistant was a Croatian fascist, an Ustasha, Dragonovic also a priest. So because he was a priest, he wanted to help save the Ustasha, who everyone was looking for after the war because they were such big criminals, such big murderers. So a lot of these people ran away to Argentina, including the person who was the head of the state of Croatia, and Dinko Šakic, who was one of the commanders of the Asenovats. So we discovered him living in Santa Teresita, which is 250 miles south of Buenos Aires. And uh, before, we worked with an Argentinian journalist. And before we sent him to confront Šakic, we sent him to Belgrade, to Yugoslav former Yugoslavia, to meet with survivors of Yasenovac. There are a few. And they told him in very graphic terms, described him, the tortures, the executions, like he, I think he, it's hard to believe even. So he goes with a TV crew and goes to knock on Dinko Šakic's door. So he knocks on the door, the door is open, Dinko Šakic opens the door, and the journalist, his name is Jorge Camarasa, says to Šakic, you're Dinko Šakic, you are the commandant of Yasenovac. So Šakic says, yes. Let's stop there for a minute. Usually, when Nazis are about to be exposed or put on trial, what do they say? Either it's not me, mistaken identity, well, it's me, but I didn't do it. You must be making a mistake. What does Dinko Šakic say? More than 50 years after Yasenovac was closed down. It's me, and I did it. So Kamarasa says to him, listen, I have, a, I have a couple questions I want to ask you. Do you mind if I come in? He says, no, no problem. Come sit in my living room. They sit down, and Kamarasa says to him, listen, you are the commandant of the worst concentration camp in the Balkans. As a matter of fact, Yasenovac was nicknamed the Auschwitz of the Balkans. What, what do you have to say for yourself? So Shakish says, what's the problem? Every country has a penal colony, has penal colonies, that's like a jail. And every person who was in Yasenovac deserved to be there. If they asked me to do it again, I would gladly do it again. So Kamaras says, listen, you can't fool me. I, I met survivors of Yasenovac. They told me about the horrors of the camp, about the incredible death rate, the typhus epidemics, everything. It was just 
I mean, like a hellhole. So Shaket says to him, listen, you don't know what you're talking about. You know what the problem with Yasenovach was? That they didn't let us finish the job. You get it? Finish the job. Kill all the Serbs, all the Jews, all the Roma, and anyone who's opposed to them. Anyway, so this, this, this interview was shown ironically on Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day. That, was done, that wasn't done on purpose. It just came out that way. And immediately, I had letters into the, uh, to the Croatians asking for the extradition. And ultimately, I mean, we had a, we had a big, uh, what do you call it? We had a big dilemma, really, where this person should be put on trial. Because if we were thinking only in terms of result, we would have sent him to Serbia. Because within five minutes after being sentenced to death, he'd be hanging from the highest tree in Belgrade. Okay? But the question we asked ourselves was, who needs the lesson of Yasenovac the most? And the answer was Croatia, where half the people think that the Ustasha are heroes. But there was a problem. The president of Croatia was a guy named Franjo Tudjman, who wrote a book in which he said the Jews basically inflated the number of victims of the Shoah from 1 million to 6 million. And not only that, he said that the Jews ran Yasenovac, which is total, total lie. But we took a gamble. He said, that country needs a trial of this bastard. We have to get him on trial. We have to get the, the testimonies. They're going to be televised all over the country every day, full coverage in the media. In other words, if we had sent him to Israel, it would be two lines on page 17. Okay? We always try to see to it that the people are put on trial in the country where they committed their crime. So that's what happened, okay? So Shakic is brought to, to Zagreb, the capital of Croatia. He's put on trial. So I'll tell you just very briefly, the most dramatic testimony came from a Jewish guy. He was already 85 years old. He'd been sent as a teenager from Sarajevo to Yasenovac. He and a bunch of his buddies, of, of his friends from Sarajevo, Jewish friends from Sarajevo, arrived a couple of days after they're in the camp. The guards take them to the edge of the camp. Now, the guards had already murdered a few dozen inmates. And after they murdered them, they cut off their arms and their legs and made a whole gigantic pile of body parts. They took these kids, kids 15, 16 years old, and they ordered them to throw the body parts into the Sava River, which flowed at the boundary of the camp. So Yaakov Finzi turned around, as he related in the testimony, to one of the guards, and he said to him, why, why are you doing this to us? So the guard said, because you murdered Jesus. He knew he was a Jew. So in other words, if you want to understand how you get a Yasenovac with at least 100,000 victims, you take hundreds of years of Christian anti-Semitism, you add the, the racism of the Nazis, the fascism of the Croatians, and that's how you get ASNOVAX. In any event, the good news is that Shakic was convicted, and he was given the maximum sentence. Now, on the day of the verdict, the courtroom was packed, but the problem was that half the people in the courtroom were actually in favor of Shakic. And the other half were against Shakic. So when the verdict was read that he's being sentenced to the maximum sentence, 20 years in prison, and he was 78 at the time already, so fist fights broke, broke out, people spit at us. Some guy said to me, why don't you go back to Israel and deal with the Palestinians? I mean, it was in an American accent he said it to me. Anyway, on my way out, I'm stopped by a tall, good-looking gentleman, very well-dressed, and he says to me, listen, I have only one word to say to you. Chvala. Chvala in Croatian means thank you. Without you, this trial never would have taken place. Now, to be honest, I had no idea who he was. So I asked someone, who is, who is this guy? And, they, and the following story emerged. And this story was a very key thing in the, in the trial. In, 19, in the spring of 44, there was some breach of this discipline in the camp. Shakic immediately calls a roll call. You know what a roll call is? Appel. All the inmates have to show up and line up in the center square of the, of Yasenova, of the camp. 
And he's walking up and down the rows and totally at random taking people out who are going to be hung. One of the people he took out of the line was a doctor from Montenegro, not Jewish, named Mila Boschkowitz. And when Shakich took him out of the line, Mila Boschkowitz said to him, listen, I'm from Montenegro, and my, it's a part of Yugoslavia, and my tradition doesn't allow me to be hung. Shakich on the spot, takes out his revolver, shoots him in the head three times. The guy who stopped me was his brother. Mila Bushkowitz's brother, who never believed in a million years that the day would come when Croatia would be independent, Croatia would be a democracy, and that democracy would put the person who murdered his brother in cold blood on trial and sentence him to 20 years in prison. In other words, it doesn't get better than that. One of the things that Mr. Wiesenthal the great Simon Wiesenthal, the great Nazi hunter, always emphasized is the debt that we owe the victims and their families. To do whatever we can to find the people who turn innocent men, women, and children into victims simply because they were categorized as enemies of the Reich. And here you see a perfect example of someone getting closure at a late date but closure nonetheless. And I, I take that story with me. You know, I face a lot of very frustrating situations. People die on me in the middle of an investigation or before a trial. You know, I'm the only Jew in the world who prays for the good health of Nazis. Okay? I, I pray for them to survive so we can bring them to justice, not the others, okay? And, and that's what, I mean, it's super important. But these people being in the 90s today, I mean, they can die at any point or they can become incapacitated at any point. So in any event, this for me is, is part of the way that I deal with the frustrations of situations like that. Remembering people like Miller Bushwitz's brother, remembering the survivors that I meet who thank me from the bottom of their hearts. Now, one last story. A lot of times people want to know how it exactly does it work. How do we get the information? So I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one story. One day I get an email from uh, Scotland. Uh, the guy says, tells the following story. He's Scottish, he has a Hungarian girlfriend, and the Hungarians in Scotland get together for social events. And an elderly person, elderly, Hungar elderly Hungarian comes to these social events, um, and he brags that he was involved in deporting the Jews of Hungary to Auschwitz. 437,000 Jews sent to Auschwitz in the spring and summer of 1944, 80% of them murdered on arrival. So this guy writes to me, he says, listen, I know the story about the Shoah. I'm not Jewish, but I know about the Shoah. And this is absolutely disgusting. Maybe someone over there could do the research to shut this guy up. That's what he said. Shut him up. I had some better ideas for him. But um, in any event, and his name is Stephen Brandon, and he's a, he was a master sergeant of the gendarmerie. That's like the a cross between police and, and army in Hungary. They were the ones who rounded up the Jews. So in other words, it was true. In other words, this, this fit. If this guy was a master sergeant of the gendarmerie, it's almost certain that he took, he had a role in the deportations to Auschwitz. But I, I wrote to the guy, I said, listen, Stephen Brandon is not a Hungarian name. And unless we can find his real name, we'll never know. We'll never be able to find any evidence against him. Right away, he writes me right away, his name is Istvan Boydashov. How did he know that? Because he, Istvan Boydashov, this guy, had, had made a monument in his backyard for some event, and he signed it with his Hungarian name. So now we knew his name, we knew his position, Okay, we have to go find him. So go to Yad Vashem. I don't know Hungarian, so I work with a very uh, wonderful researcher named Dr. Bar Shaked. We're looking, look, he's looking, couldn't find anything on this guy. Okay, a couple of months go by, and a journalist from Scotland comes to interview me for a magazine story for the Glasgow Herald. And this guy made a very good impression on me. I said, listen, maybe you can help me. We have this case in Scotland, and we can't, we can't, 
you know, uh, we don't know where this guy was during the war. In other words, it's one thing to look from all over Hungary, look for evidence all over Hungary. It's another thing to be able to focus on one place where this person served in 1944, in the spring of 44. I said to him, listen, his name was Michael Turney, the journalist. I said, Michael, what I want you to do is the following. I want you to call up this guy, Istvan Boydashov, tell him that the Glasgow Herald wants to do a full color uh, feature story for the Sunday magazine on Hungarians in Scotland. Okay? That's an important subject, no? Hungarians in Scotland? <laughs> no one's laughing. It's a joke. Okay? Um, so, and he will invite you to his house. I'll tell you how I knew that in a minute. And while you're in the house, ask him where he was during the war. Okay? Okay. Michael Turney says, I'm doing it. No problems. He calls up, how did I know that Boyda Show would invite him to the house? Because in the, in the feature story, which needs a lot of pictures, he wanted to show that he had built a monument to some Hungarian hero in his backyard. That's where he signed. He signed in the bottom, uh, Ishvan Boydashov, Master Sergeant. So, of course, he wanted to show that to him. In any event, Michael Turney went to visit him. He interviewed him. And the next day, I get an email. Listen, I have good news, and I have even better news. What? What's the good news? The good news, he's from Mishkos. I don't know if you know where that is. It's the sixth largest city in Hungary. 12,000 Jews deported in the spring of 44, in June. Okay, what's the better news? He says, listen to this. On the wall in Boydashov's house is a photograph, fairly large photograph, of a man in a, of an officer, a high officer, in the gendarmerie uh, uniform on his wall. So I asked Boydashov, it's obviously not him, it's someone else. So I said, who is this guy on your wall? Ah, okay, that's Shandor Kapiro, that's his name. And he's a much, he was a much higher officer than me, and we're in contact all the time. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. A higher officer higher than him. He's in contact with him all the time. And who knows, maybe it's a, it's a big fish we're catching here. So I said, to, uh, I said to Michael Turner, I said to the journalist, listen, that's all wonderful, but where is he? Where is this Shando Capiro? So I want you to call him up and very nonchalantly ask him. I mean, don't get excited or anything. Ask him, you know, sort of a uh, curiosity. Uh, where is the guy? Sure enough, he said he's in Hungary. Okay. Hungary is a big place. Anyway, so I go to, I go to, um, the next day I went to Bar Shaked, the guy who was working on the case, and I wanted to tell him the good news. So I said to him, listen, you know, um, we can look now, we can focus on Mishkots, that's where Boydashow was. But uh, apparently there's this guy, Shanda Kapiro, who's also alive, and he's a good friend of Boydashow's, and they're in contact all the time. And Barashaked went white. Like, he, I thought he was gonna faint. I said to him, well, who is he? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote him in Hebrew first, okay? Because the people who understand Hebrew will appreciate what he said. So I have to tell you that Bar Shaked is a very religious Jew. He used to be Haredi, now he's regular Dati, but he's very religious. So his reaction was, Ma, haben zona ze adayin b'chayim? So, which means, what? You mean to say that son of a bitch is still alive? He knew exactly who Kapiro was. And the story is actually quite amazing. Kapiro was a member of a group of officers who carried out the murder of thousands of people, several thousand people in and around the city of Novi Sad in Northern Yugoslavia, Serbia today, on January 21st to 23rd, 1942. And the interesting part about the story is that these officers were actually put on trial in Hungary in December 43, because they carried out an unauthorized operation. Okay, and I'll explain to you what happened very briefly, okay? In any event, the story is that they were all convicted. The, set, the trial ended on January 23rd, the anniversary of the murders. All of them were convicted. Some were sentenced to death, the others to jail. 
But what happened was, if any of you know the history, what happened on March 19, 1944, the Nazis invaded Hungary. The Nazis put pressure on the Hungarians to cancel the conviction of all the 15 officers. So not only weren't they punished, they were sent back to serve, whether it was in the military or in the gendarmerie. Anyway, after the war, Shapiro ran away. And in 1994, apparently, he ran away to Argentina. And in 1994, he walked into the Hungarian embassy and said, is there any reason why I shouldn't go back to Budapest? They said, no, you can come back. So he's living in Buda, right opposite a functioning shul, this guy. Okay? In other words, he's been convicted, he's never been punished, and he's alive and well. Okay, terrific. But we didn't know that. We had to find him, of course, and we found him in the phone book, believe it or not. I had some Hungarian uh, uh, people from the faith church who were very pro-Israel and pro-Jewish. They helped me, and they got him on the phone. And uh, they, they, they were posing as students writing a paper about World War II or something. And he admitted he'd been in gendarmerie, he was in Novisad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I went to the, to the Hungarian prosecution. I said, this guy is here sitting in Budapest and he was sentenced to prison and he was never in prison. And now you have to either put him in prison or, or, or put him on trial. So they said, okay, but listen, there's no statute of limitations. I mean, there's no, the, you, the time that has passed is irrelevant, but we have to see if it's crimes against humanity. So we have to find the verdict. So they look in the archives, one week goes by, two weeks go by, no sign of the verdict. It's like someone cleaned out his file. But we have all sorts of ways of getting around that. In Serbia, where the crime took place, there is a copy of the verdict. First I found in Serbian, then I even found in the original Hungarian. Okay, Yofi. So I give it to the, I, I give it to the, uh, to the prosecution, and I say to them, why don't you just implement the sentence? You know, you know that he was sentenced by a Hungarian court. Why don't you just send him to jail? Well, we'll see. We don't know. Six months later, they say, we can't do it. It's against the law. The, the verdict was canceled. We need a new investigation. Meanwhile, they're playing for time and I'm going crazy. In other words, they want to do everything possible to put this off, knowing that the more that they delay, the greater the chance Capiro will never be, never be put on trial. But Capiro doesn't exactly cooperate. He's healthy at 92, he's healthy at 93, he's healthy at 94. And in the meantime, guess what? He sues me for libel. What's the libel? I gave a speech in Budapest on Hungarian Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Day, and I said he's a moral monster of the Holocaust. Okay, so why did I say that? Let me tell you what happened in Novi Sad. On the night, on the, on the night of the January 22nd and the day of January 23rd. That night, the city of Novi Sad was divided up into sections and an officer was put in charge of each section. And they were given instructions. Your job is to round up all the Jews, Serbs, and Roma and take them to a large building in the middle of town where a committee of Hungarian officers will decide if any of them should be released. So in other words, every section has an officer and the officers were told specifically, if you encounter any opposition, shoot. Now, Chanda Capiro, at this point in time, is already 28 years old. He's a lawyer. He's completed his studies. He says to the commander, I want to see the order in writing. Now, why does he do that? Because he knows damn well that this is an illegal order, absolutely illegal. The order officer says to him, sorry, but these orders are only transmitted verbally, Balpe, only verbally. What does Shanda Kapiro do? He's smart, he's educated, he's intelligent. He knows that the order is illegal and he does it anyway. So in other words, he's not some ignorant peasant who was brainwashed and went out to kill Jews. This is a guy who knows the score, he's smart and he's educated, he does it anyway. So he sues me for libel. 
That's the libel. In other words, I called him a Nazi, and I called him a moral monster to show up. In the meantime, Hungary isn't putting the guy on trial. So what am I going to do? Do I go to the trial in Hungary, at my own trial, or not? And in Hungary, a libel trial is a criminal trial. If I lose, it's not like I have to pay a fine. It could be two years in jail in Budapest. And frankly, I don't like goulash and certainly not kosher, unkosher goulash, if you get it. Okay? So in the meantime, but there's no trial. So I said, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to go there because it might be the only chance I'll have to explain to the Hungarian public why Shandor Kapira was a Nazi war criminal. Okay? So I go to the trial. I go to the trial. Okay? One of the amazing things about the trial, and I was totally unprepared for this. I had no idea what was going to happen. All of a sudden, the judge says to me, do you have any questions for Mr. Capiro? I go, oh, ah, really? Yeah, okay. I have some questions. What were the, Mr. Capiro, what were the orders that you received on the night of January 22nd? He said, to look for terrorists. I go, oh, really? You mean like the four-year-old boy who I met today in living in Novi Sad, not today, previously in Novi Sad, who was on his father's shoulder waiting to be shot by you and other people? The judge disqualified the question. Anyway, so I couldn't ask any really good questions. And uh, one of the journalists who was like on our side, she caught Capiro as he was leaving the courtroom on that day. And she said to him, Mr. Capiro, do you have any regrets? So he said, no, no, I was only doing my duty. Typical bullshit, come of course, you'll excuse me. In any event, um, so what happened was that when Hungary became the president of the European Union, and there was a rotating presidency in the European Union, all of a sudden they charged him. They charged him, they accused him of participation in, in murder, and he was put on trial. Okay, so he's put on trial. We come to the trial, and how did the trial begin? The judge says, all the evidence that was collected in the 1943-44 trial is disqualified. We can't use it. We can't accept it. Now, you all understand, how do we know so much about, about what happened in Novi Sad? Because of that trial. And it was clear what he had done. So in other words, the, the, the court made sure that we would lose the trial, that Capiro would be acquitted. And that's what happened. I have to say one of the worst days of my life. Anyway, the, the government, the Hungarian government appealed the ruling. Okay, in other words, what happened there, the place was full again. The, the, the place was packed with people, half of whom were in favor of Capiro. They couldn't even believe their ears that he'd been acquitted. They knew he was guilty. Everyone knew he was guilty. But the Hungarian court didn't have the guts to prosecute him. But I'll tell you one thing that, for me, really, I, leave, I left that trial with. On the day of the trial, there were 30 kids from the faith church. That's the, I told you, pro-Israel, pro-Jewish church, evangelical, like an evangelical church in, in Hungary standing outside with big signs, thou shalt not murder, remember Novi Sad. And, and when I walked out of the court, I walked out of the court for some reason and I saw these people, I was really, uh, I tell you the truth, I was really emotional, they started clapping for me. And maybe that's one of the best minutes of my life. And in other words, to see non-Jewish kids who appreciated what we were doing, trying to bring this Capiro to trial, and them doing whatever they could. They also came to the libel trial to support me. So this was like an unexpected byproduct. In any event, we, uh, uh, the Hungarian government appealed, as I said, and unfortunately Capiro died before the appeal could be heard. He was given a hero's burial by the Jobbik. Jobbik is the fascist Hungarians. And we're left uh, really, really devastated. I put in five and a half years to try and bring that bastard to trial, but at least I know I ruined his life. In other words, instead of dying in peace and tranquility, he was harassed by journalists. He was worried about the trial. He was 
you know, furious that he had been he had been accused of being a Nazi and all that. And sometimes we have no choice but to, in a sense, console ourselves with what is only, you know, a very partial victory. So I want to I want to end by saying just a, a few words. First of all, I thank God every day that I have a chance to do what I do. In other words, I can't imagine something. I mean, there are many ways of helping Am Yisrael, but this, in this sense, we're helping people who, who were no longer alive and couldn't help themselves. We're doing it on their behalf and to, in a sense, create justice for, their, for, their, for the crimes committed against them. And that's a great privilege, I have to say. One other thing that I, I want to emphasize, and that is the many absolutely wonderful people I met along the way who helped us in research and all sorts of, you know, uh, translating, things like that. Many of them non-Jews, okay? Not all Goyim hate Jews. Remember, that's very important. These people did it in many, most cases without getting a penny. They did it because they knew it was the right thing to do. And of course, Jews who helped us also, of course. There are plenty of those, thank God. So in other words, I felt a lot of support and a lot of um, help. And this is also what helps, what helps overcome the frustration. But, but the most important thing is, and this I never forget, is that whatever frustration I'm facing, it's absolutely nothing compared to what happened to the victims and their families. So things have to be put into proportion. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Amazing. I mean, thank you so much, Ephraim. A big applause to Ephraim. Wow. All right. So ah, one second, one second. Before I begin the questions, if any of you are interested and are interested in following what we do, okay? So I'm on Twitter and on Facebook. My, my Twitter tag is at capital E, capital Z, U R O double -F, F F, okay? And we're on Facebook. The Wiesenthal Center has a wonderful website, wiesenthal.com. I have a website of my own, Operation Last Chance which is the name of the project in which we offer money in return for information, okay, which has helped us bring Nazis to justice. Lowercase, operationlastchance.org. Ephraim, can yeah. I ask a question? This is yeah. Matt. How are you? I want to ask you a question after, let's say, in the future, 10, 20 years from now. What will be your part and other people of your legacy that's going to continue such a thing like that when all of those died? What is your project that's going to keep it this stories alive? Okay, so first of all, there is an enormous amount of work being done to document the Shoah. Okay, for the last 70 years, in a sense, we've been preparing for the day when there are no longer any survivors. We have tens of thousands of taped testimonies and it's not only us, I'm talking, we're talking about thousands of people all over the world are involved in Holocaust research, Holocaust education. There's no danger that the Holocaust will be forgotten, not in the immediate future. Now, i tell you something interesting about Simon Wiesenthal. If you ask me what was Simon Wiesenthal's greatest fear, okay, it wasn't that criminal X or Y would not be caught. It was that the Holocaust would be forgotten. Now, you have to remember, he operated after World War II in the 50s, 60s, into the 70s. There's no comparison between the amount of information that's available today on, in so many different forms, books, theater, movies, internet, you name it, than to what was available then. And the interest and the sensitivity that exists today vis-a-vis -vis the Shoah. So, that, that was his greatest fear, and, and, and he and people like Elie Wiesel, actually the two of them were the main torch bearers to keep that memory alive. And if today there is so much, it's to a certain extent thanks to people like that. Okay, but let me explain something. Already 20 years ago, the Simon Wiesenthal Center decided that 
the major priority will not be hunting Nazis, but will be the fight against anti-Semitism, and in more recent years, the fight also against the delegitimization of Israel, okay? Now, what I'm doing is, my, one of my major tasks, and I'm devoting an enormous amount of time to this, is the fight against the rewriting of the history of the Shoah in Eastern Europe. Now, this is being done because the countries of Eastern Europe, the people who helped the Nazis, were, act, were actively involved in murder. I just wrote a book about Lithuania. And just briefly, I can tell you, in Lithuania, there were 220,000 Jews who lived under the Nazi occupation. 212,000 were murdered. Now, 90% of them were not murdered in death camps. They were murdered, they were murdered near their homes, shot. These are the people who were killed by the Einsatzgruppen. Now, the Einsatzgruppen numbered only about 7,000 men, and they had to cover an area from the North Sea all the way to Odessa, to the Black Sea. They murdered a million and a half Jews in two years. How is it possible? Each one had to be murdered individually. It was possible if you had thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of local helpers. In Lithuania, there was less than a thousand Germans during the Nazi occupation. They murdered 212,000 Jews, each one of whom had to be murdered individually. No gas chambers, okay? So you see that the role played by Lithuanians was huge, but Lithuanians refused to acknowledge their role in the murder of the Jews. In other words, they speak a lot about the Shoah. Oi, what a tragedy. Our Jews were murdered by the Nazis. Oi, va, voi. But what about your role? Ah, maybe. Listen, there were a few degenerates, marginal elements of society. They're not part of us. They're not real Lithuanians. Understand? And we exposed this. I, I wrote the book together with a Lithuanian, very popular Lithuanian author who discovered six years ago that her relatives were involved in killing Jews. Her grandfather and her, and her aunt's husband, okay? And she wanted to atone for it. So we went to 40 mass graves of Jewish victims of Lithuanians, 35 in Lithuania and five in Belarus because the Lithuanian police unit was sent to Belarus to murder Jew Belarusian Jews, 20,000 Belarusian Jews murdered by Lithuanians, okay? We wanted to see if we can find the places. Are they marked? Most of them are marked. Most of them are neglected. Okay, we went to, we interviewed eyewitnesses. We, we interviewed people living right next to the mass graves. There's 234 mass Holocaust graves in Lithuania, a country less than the size of New Jersey. Okay, and we, had, we heard amazing stories. We, wherever we went, we asked the people, who did the murders? Who carried the murders? Invariably, the answer was the Lithuanians. So we, so our book that we wrote is now, it just came out in English now. It's called Our People, Discovering Lithuania's Hidden Holocaust, okay? And on the cover are two faces. One was of a Jew named Yitzhak Anolik, who represented Lithuania in two Olympics as a cyclist. And Ruta Vanagaita, she's my co-author, she said, in response to his picture, she said, good enough to represent us in the Olympics, not good enough to live. Murdered in the Kovna ghetto. The other picture, Balas Norvesia, the, the commander, Lithuanian commander, the killing squad at Pona, where 70,000 Jews were murdered. If you look at the pictures from a distance, you can't tell the difference between them. But in both cases, the murderers and the Jews, Lithuanians, washed their hands of the whole thing. The Jews, they were communists. They got what they deserved. The killers, a bunch of degenerates. But both those groups are part and parcel of Lithuanian society. And Lithuanian society bears a very, very heavy share of the guilt. So this book that we wrote in Lithuania, it came out first in Lithuania, it created an enormous scandal. And uh, my co-author had to leave Lithuania for three years and come live in Israel so that no one would kill her. So in, in any event, if you're interested, if any of you are interested, again, the name of the book is Our People, Discovering Lithuania's Hidden Holocaust. 
published by Roman and Littlefield, came out several months ago. And um, it's, I tell you, it's a book that, that we shed a lot of tears over. We went 40 days, not consecutively, it was broken up, but 40 days to the mass graves. Mass grave after mass grave, Kaddish, El Malay Rachamim. It, 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 it affected me like nothing else that I've ever done, I have to say. Hey, Frank, <laughs> Hello? I have a Hello. question. Yeah. Um, what was the role of, uh, of the Mossad? I mean, Ben Gurion, not Ben Gurion, the begging. Lava Shalom, he reinstated the whole uh, search for the uh, Nazis uh, when, he, uh, when he was a uh, prime minister in the late 70s. And then most of their attempts, at least those that uh, were advertised, failed. All of them. Yet, All of them. Yet they did a very good work, you know, eight years earlier, working on the, you know, hunting down the people, the terrorists from uh, Munich uh, Olympics. And so how do you, where were the more complications doing these types of oper operations in, in comparison to other operations that the Mossad was used to do in those days? Okay, so first of all, a couple of the facts. Let's start with the facts. You're more or less correct what you said, okay? But in 13 years ago, the Mossad commissioned three books about all the efforts or almost all the efforts to bring Nazis to justice by the Mossad, okay? The three books are the following. One book was solely about the efforts to find Mengele, 344 pages, okay? I'll explain each one in a minute. One was the historical, the history of a unit set up in 1960 in the wake of a wave of anti-Semitic incidents in Europe, which in Israel, for some reason, they thought was the work of old Nazis. Turns out that wasn't true. But that unit was then supposed to combat anti-Semitism and also hunt Nazis. Now the unit was called Amal, Ein Mem Lamed. And you know what it's short for? Amalek. Okay, it's short for Amalek, Amal. Okay, and the third volume was of all the operations that the Mossad mounted, with the exception of the two that were successful. Only two were successful. Adolf Eichmann, which was a great success, and the execution in Uruguay of a Latvian mass murderer called Herbert Sukos. okay? All the others failed. Ralph, Muir, Bobby, you name it. Now, as you said correctly, when Menachem Begin became prime minister, he renewed the search for Nazi war criminals. Now, it is basically stopped in 1962, 61, 62, and there are several different explanations. The most convincing explanation is that the Egyptians had brought German scientists who worked on the V2s, those were the rockets that I spoke about previously, ballistic missiles, to set up a, a ballistic missiles program in Egypt that would destroy Israel. And this was considered an existential threat to Israel, and the Mossad was commissioned to make sure that those scientists didn't stay in Egypt, which is exactly what happened. They even hired a Nazi to help them take action against the scientists, an old Nazi, Atos Korzeny, which is a whole story in itself. But after that, the heads of the Mossad were not interested in pursuing this. And I have to tell you, part of the problem is that all the heads of the Mossad were Sabras. Except, in other words, Begin was the only prime minister uh, after, in other words, Ben-Gurion and Eshkol were born in, in, in Chutzlar, it's in, uh, overseas. But I'm saying Rabin was born in Israel and others were born in Israel and they didn't have the same, oh, how should I put it, the same Jewish, you know, deep, deep sentiment vis-a-vis -vis the Shoah that, the, that Begin had. And that's why it was renewed, but it was renewed without any success, to be, act, to be honest. And it was never a priority. That's, that's, I read all three books. I read every page of those three books, because obviously the subject was of great interest to me. And it was very, very disappointing. 
the two operations that succeeded was, were unbelievable, and they were very important. Eichmann, obviously, but it, Sukos is far less known. Sukos was a mass murderer, a horrendous, a, a real sadist, murdered thousands of people, helped murder tens of thousands of, people, of Jews in, in Latvia, and uh, he got what he deserved, no question. But uh, I'm sorry to say that the attempts to get Walter Ralph, who, de who devised the gas vans and, and uh, was in charge of, uh, would have been in charge of Eretz Israel if the Nazis, God forbid, had, had, had occupied Eretz Israel. He was head of the technical division of the Reich Security Main Office, and others like Klaus Barbie, Franz Murrah from the Vilna Ghetto, and others were, were unsuccessful. In other words, th but there's one, there's one thing we can say in defense of Israel, okay? Israel, from the day it was born, from the day it was declared, has not had one day of peace. And the existential problems that Israel faced were, I'm sorry to say, in a certain sense, more pressing and more important than to kill Nazis or to, to you know, to uh, bring them to justice. Because if Israel had taken it upon itself, to bring Nazis to justice, then no country would be willing to prosecute them. They'd all say, take them to Israel. Let Israel become the garbage, the garbage can of, of, of the issue, which Israel doesn't deserve. If I, if I, if I may ask, uh, I'm not comparing situations, of course, right? Uh, but just broadly, uh, you've talked about political issues you faced throughout all your fight, and I congratulate for your, all your, your effort for doing this for our, our, our people and for humanity. But uh, I, I would like to understand, um, I, I am uh, facing, not, not comparing situation, I want to make my, myself clear, also a big issue, political issue, when uh, fighting child sexual abuse inside the Jewish community. And so what, what would you say to me or to the people that are listening to you when inside our people, uh, among leaders, and I'm not embarrassed to say, I'm embarrassed not to say, among rabbis, among big leaders, among politics, they are in silence when children are being uh, injured uh, in many ways. So. How, how could we uh, want to fight, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but how do we want to fight people that are attacking our people if inside our, our, our own, own community, we're in silence? That's my question. Okay, first of all, I would say to you that thank God in certain communities there's already been a very significant change. And victims are speaking out and the communities, is, is, in some communities, not all communities, obviously, are starting to take this very seriously with no tolerance for pedophiles and people who sexually molest, you know, defenseless children or people who are older. But this is a fight that, it, that has actually begun already. In other words, uh, you have people like Manny Wax in Australia, you have other people who are fighting the, the good fight, and, and rightfully so. We need, first of all, for the victims to be, to be willing to come forward. And this is a very difficult thing for the victims, as you can imagine. And we need political support to win this battle. But listen, we have a lot of issues in the Jewish community that, we're, that uh, we have to deal with. And that's certainly one of them. And it should be high on the agenda. Thank you. I am getting a lot of questions here in private. Um, I encourage you all guys, to, you can open the mic. Just I will translate some of them that they are coming in Spanish. Um, so I'll give you three together uh, and you can answer. Uh, okay. <laughs> so do you think there are um, Nazi survivors at this point that are still alive? And uh, then like what happens like with all this work that you are doing, you, you already asked a little bit, but do you think it can be applied to other genocides or other situations that the center um, bring these tools to somewhere else? And uh, since there are many Argentinians are asking like if Hitler in Maximo 
um, do you think he survived and made it? No, 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 no. It's all Bubba Mices. <laughs> Definitely not. Okay, but uh, first okay, of all... that's an easy one. <laughs> Thank that's you. That's an easy one. Listen, first of all, the reason there are still Nazis, and I didn't go into this uh, really in my remarks, there still are cases going on. Just uh, a month and a half ago, there was a verdict in Hamburg against the guard from the Stutthof camp where 65,000 people were murdered, 28,000 Jews. Uh, the first camp built outside the Third Reich. Um, and the reason that there are still Nazis alive is because of the extension of life expectancy. In other words, people are living much longer these days. And I say sometimes half as a joke, people without a conscience maybe live longer. No one gets the jokes around here. What's going on? <laughs> Okay, that's, that's one thing. Uh, and the other thing is that um, I, I'll give you an example. I went twice to Rwanda after the genocide. I was an advisor to the Rwandan government on how to help bring uh, people who committed genocide who ran away to other countries, how to bring them to justice in Rwanda or at the International UN Tribunal in Arusha and Tanzania. Um, but um, at the Wiesendorf Center, they decided that they don't, I, I, I was even thinking of opening an office in, in, in Rwanda to help them there. But the Wiesendorf Center felt that the mandate, that their mission was really uh, to stick to the Shoah. And, but there's no question that a lot of the work that we're doing has applications to other cases of genocide or ethnic cleansing. And they, they learn from what we did in terms of commemoration of the Shoah, pr prosecution of, of perpetrators, and the education. I have a three-part question. Only three? <laughs> <laughs> Only three. Um, okay, so you mentioned in the beginning in your remarks that uh, how many Nazis worked for the U.S. government during the Cold War. So firstly, were those Nazis ever investigated uh, and what happened to them? Second, is the U.S. government still investigating Nazis associated uh, with the U.S. government? And lastly, is the office that you worked for with the DOJ, is that still open and active? Okay, the office, of the, the, the office in the DOJ is now the special prosecution section of the criminal division of the U.S. Justice Department. Um, only one of those scientists, actually he's an engineer, Arthur Rudolph, was, was, uh, they were able to cancel his American citizenship and get him out of the United States. Um, by the way, in America, you can't prosecute Nazis for the crimes because the crimes were committed overseas and the victims were not Americans. So what the Americans did was, in order to change that, they would have had to get the approval of two thirds of the states and it would have taken years. So what the Americans did, I, I jokingly say they opted for the Al Capone compromise. In other words, the same way that Al Capone was tried for in income tax evasion instead of for murder. So these people were tried for immigration and naturalization violations. They lied on their immigration applications and then on their citizenship applications when they were asked the same questions. They were asked, did you ever fight against the allies? They asked, did you ever, were you ever a member of a movement that, that persecuted people because of their religion or because of their ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, um, so right now, uh, they, they, are still, they, they are still in operation. They just won a case against a Nazi from uh, guard from the Neuengamme concentration camp in, in March. And now he's facing deportation from the United States and we hope he will be deported. And, uh, but most of their cases now are from other, from other tragedies. Thank you. I have, I have a question. Um, you mentioned that um, anti-Semitism is now the focus. I live in Los Angeles and um, I dedicate my Facebook and my social media to point out anti-Semitism because a lot of people that I grew up with weren't Jewish, and I feel like in California, anti-Semitism is on the rise. I mean, not only here, uh, across the United States, 
And the young people and the people in our generation, I don't feel are doing enough to stick up to injustices, whether that's in on college campuses or afterwards um, in the workplace, in social media. What would you suggest to our generation um, how to combat this? Okay, so I, I would say that the person you have to speak to is someone named Rick Eaton, E-A-T-O-N, Rick Eaton at the Wiesenthal Center in LA, or Rabbi Abraham Cooper. They are the people who are in charge of the efforts to combat anti-Semitism. They also are in charge of the efforts to monitor anti-Semitism in social networks. They're in, they're in contact with Facebook. They're in conversation with Facebook now about problems with Holocaust denial, for example, on Facebook, and with uh, Twitter, and all these uh, very, very important companies. So we're very much aware of it. I'm not the person who deals with it. In other words, I have other, other uh, obligations. And I will, I'm also not in the United States. So, I mean, uh, so, they, but they're doing it, and they're devoting a tremendous amount of attention to it. And I would say that you should go down to the center on Pico Boulevard, if you know where that is, in LA. <laughs> there are all the kosher restaurants over there. And, uh, I've been there, I've been there a few times. <laughs> and uh, you should try and make an appointment. Well, I, you can't do that now because of COVID-19, but you should, uh, you know what? Um, Rabbi Cooper's uh, email is acooper at wiesenthal.com. Okay, and, uh, and ask maybe for Rick Eaton's uh, phone number. He's the guy on the ground. Rabbi Cooper's more the negotiator with the companies, things like this. And uh, I'm sure there must be something you could do to help. And you'll be made aware also of what they're doing, which is also important. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I, I will try to put here two questions together uh, from Spanish. Um, when you found uh, a Nazi, how, um, how do you take them out of that country that you found them? Do you do it through the government, legally, illegally, because there is an, also an Argentinian case very well known that uh, it was taken without uh, permission of the government? And once uh, you do it, you, you uh, capture the Nazi, uh, do you take out all his properties and belongings uh, and making him unable to inherit? Listen, first of all, let's start with this. I work for an NGO. That's a non-governmental organization called the Simon Wiesendorf Center. We cannot prosecute anybody. Only governments can prosecute, okay? So we work through governments. In other words, we uh, try and see to it that this person is put on trial in the country either where he committed the crime or the country which sent him to commit, him or her to, to commit the crime, or the country where this trial will have the most important impact. This is what I tried to explain about Shakic. When Shakic, when we went after Dinko Shakic, okay, that's the second case that I spoke about. So there were six different countries where in theory he could have been put on trial. He could have been put on trial in Argentina, in theory, okay? in Israel, in Germany, in Bosnia, Serbia, or Croatia. But the country that needed this trial the most was undoubtedly Croatia, and that's where the camp that he was the commander of, Yasenovac, was located. So we tried very hard to see to it that he was put on trial there, and he was put on trial there. And to the credit of the Croatians, they actually did a good job in putting him on trial, and the tr and trial had a big impact on Croatia. But, I mean, th th this is, this is uh, really a very difficult thing if the country that should put him on trial doesn't put him on trial or doesn't want to put him on trial. And then we have to really go to war with them, so to speak, and make them, embarrass them in any way possible to make them do the right thing. I can tell you, I can tell you that in England, we fought almost five years to get the government to pass the law to enable criminal prosecution in, uh, in Great Britain for almost five years. And um, we did it by exposing the cases. In other words, by doing as much to, to, to bring survivors to the media, 
the, the role of the media here is very, very important. We had some of the media in England was against us, dead set against us, and some of the media in England was, was very much in favor of us, and that helped us. And we need local helpers. In other words, we, coming from the outside, it's almost impossible to get a government to change its, its decision. So you have to find local allies, and you need local allies in the media as well, and that's how you work to create the pressure to get the government to change its mind. Oh, you also had a question. Um, it was, can I ask right now? Yeah, 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 go ahead, Alex. It, yeah, it's regarding, like, you also said what we, what we have for the future, for the future that uh, there's so much information that we are, uh, today we can uh, just record everything and uh, leave it for the future. And uh, in this question, I know that all the Jewish people around the world, we have a mission of, of course, helping in, uh, in that terms, but also we are in a, in a uh, we're living today in a world where misinformation is also a very important thing. And we see that uh, it's very easy for groups to try to um, deny the Holocaust or deny uh, some facts of uh, that, of course, uh, the horrible facts that happened. And we see in the future that uh, there are also some countries, for example, I, as I understand that Germany, that has uh, very strict laws regarding uh, the uh, misinformation um, well, in terms of, the, of uh, the Holocaust. I don't know if either Simon Wiesenthal Center or Yad Vashem are uh, collaborating also for other countries to have also some kind of laws to be able to also um, like um, uh, prohibit in some way the misinformation regarding uh, the, the Holocaust. Okay, so first of all, quite a few countries already outlaw Holocaust denial. And it's especially important that those laws are passed in the countries where the crimes took place. It's less important in the countries where the crimes didn't take place. But I want to I tell you that the good news is that in the Western world now, I'm not talking about the Muslim world, the Arab world, in the, in the Western world, the fight against Holocaust denial has more or less been won. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be someone who might try and, and deny the Shoah, but these are people who have absolutely no influence. There's no political party, social organization of any importance in the Western world that supports Holocaust denial. Now, part of this was the victory over David Irving in, in London about 10 years ago. He was the most dangerous Holocaust denier because he originally was a legitimate historian, very charismatic and, and very uh, eloquent. And he sued Deborah Lipstadt, the historian from Emory University for calling him a denier and he lost. And in, in Britain, the laws against, for, for libel are very much in favor of the person. In other words, I was sued for libel in Britain as well. And even though the accusations that were made against me were pure fiction, it was very hard to win the trial. So, but, but what happened was that a, a lot of Jewish organizations came together to support Deborah Lipstadt and to fund her defense and to hire Anthony Julius, a brilliant Jewish lawyer in London, who's really the best. And he won in, in a very brilliant way. And he brought people like Richard Evans, the Cambridge historian who taught Irving to shreds. So that, that, that's the good news. The problem we face today, the major problem in terms of denial, I'm not talking about distortion. Denial is in the Arab world, the Muslim world where they don't learn history the same way. Most of them learn absolutely false facts. And in some cases, the Holocaust denial is government inspired and government funded. And in some cases, like in Iran, the previous, previous president, Ahmad bin Ajad, goes on national television, says the Shoah didn't happen. So you know what? Most Iranians don't believe him. But there's enough I Iranians out there who, who believe this, this Shtuyot, I mean, the, all these lies. So th this is what we're up against. So, but we're already, I mean, we have things in place. We, Wiesendor Center has a website in Farsi. Yad Vashem has a website in Farsi. Uh, there's the Aladdin Project in North Africa, training teachers to teach the Shoah. And there's other initiatives, but this is an uphill battle. 
And uh, this is the major challenge in, for that issue in the 21st century. Thank you. So um, some Argentinians here are, are saying that they heard all the shenanigans it told about Hitler in Maximo. The, so like they would like you to um, uh, go a little further, like if you have evidence, because they said like the body was never found, like what, what was going on? Oh, no, it's not true. The body was found. Parts of the body were found. The forensics proved it was Hitler's teeth. The Russians have it. And, and there's no question about it. Listen, the, Hitler is the kind, of, it, it, kind of character in history who even if he had been hung publicly in front of a million people, they still wouldn't believe that he was dead. It's like Mengele, I'm telling you. They, all the tests proved that the body in Embu near Sao Paulo of the guy who died of a stroke swimming in the Atlantic Ocean, named Joseph Mengele, was Joseph, and his name was Helmut Gregor, actually, his false name, was, 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 was Mengele. No, there's still people, no, he was so, he was so clever, he was so crafty, he's fooling everybody, he's really alive. I mean, this is all Bubba Mices, if you know what that is. Tall tales. And will you please repeat the Facebook and Instagram address? Uh, First of all, there's no Instagram address, because there is no Instagram. <laughs> Okay, um, on Facebook, it's my name. In other words, uh, but uh, the twi on Twitter, it's capital E, capital Z, U at, in other words, at capital E, capital Z, U R O F F. Okay, so you can join my thousands of followers. Great, I will write it here for in the chat for everyone. Okay, your feet to the back. Any other question, guys? Yeah, I have a question. Um, you mentioned all along, you know, how of the the that it's how hard it is for the all the time you try to um, persecute and track down those, not persecute, those, not persecute, track down those uh, criminals you. in their. The persecute is something different. What is that? I said to, to persecute is not to prosecute. You mean to prosecute, it means to bring to justice. Persecuting is, you know. No, 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 I meant that's, that's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in there, in the countries where they committed the crimes. Now, when you have a, what part of, what role was the Germany's uh, intelligence uh, office, the uh, BND was, ta was taking in all of these efforts um, when it was established, because it was you know, West Germany at, at some point had its own intelligence body. Did they play a role in that? Did they help or, or not really? Listen, the, the record of Germany in terms of prosecution and all these issues is terrible, absolutely terrible. The BND, which is the German Secret Service, knew about quite a few of these people and was even in contact with some of them they were serving as agents for them. And if you look at the numbers, until 1985, there were 200,000 investigations of Nazis, 120,000 indictments, less than 7,000 people were punished. That's until 85. Wow. It's horrible, it's horrible. Listen, Germany, had, you know, everyone thinks that Germany really faced its past in the best way possible. That's true maybe in terms of level of restitution or, or commemoration, but it's certainly not the case in terms of justice. And for many years there were legal, listen, Germany refused to use the legal tools that were created at Nuremberg. At Nuremberg they created two categories, war crimes and crimes against humanity. And had the German judiciary, the German courts used those categories, they would have uh, convicted far more criminals. They tried, they tried people in Germany on a, a Prussian statute of 1870. That's how they tried them for mass murder in the Holocaust. I mean, it was a ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. But most, so many of the judges had been Nazis themselves. So...
I have another question. Um, but for you didn't you. follow my Koopa yet. <laughs> <laughs> I added them on Facebook. I'm working on it. Okay. Um, my my question is, in your opinion, with the amount of hate towards Jews today around the world, and the hate we get towards Israel, do you ever think that another Holocaust can happen again? Okay, listen, first of all, because it already happened once, it in theory can happen again. It doesn't mean that today we're living in a repeat of the 30s. We're not living in a repeat of the 30s. There are very many significant, important differences, one of them being, of course, the state of Israel. In other words, part of the plight of the Jews of Europe was that no country wanted to accept them. Now, thank God we have a country. Okay, and we have a country that's not only a country, it also has an army and an air force and, and a certain ability to defend ourselves. So this is a major difference. Um, but the, the part of the, the most scary thing really today is that some rogue terrorist group will be able to get their hands on the weapons of mass destruction. This is the problem. In other words, the technology has advanced so much that the crimes that are possible technically, technically possible today, are far greater than the crimes of, of the days of World War II. And even with those relatively primitive tools, they murdered six million Jews. So, and, and millions of others were also murdered, other victims of the Nazis. So in other words, it's possible, but I, I, in other words, I don't foresee such a thing happening but again, things change. You can never tell. Um, I have a two part. So the second question is, do you think that America in the next 20, 30, 50 years will become um, as anti-Semitic as Europe? I'd like to think not, but I'm telling you, I'm quite concerned by what's going on there. And um, so there's a, on, a lot of, on a lot of different levels. In other words, there's, there's a rise in anti-Semitism, undoubtedly. Um, the fight for minorities is being tainted by anti-Semitism. You know, Black Lives Matter. Black lives do matter, but, but they shouldn't be, you know, uh, promoting anti-Semitism. And um, in general, America is undergoing tremendous changes, which are changing the face of the country. And... Uh, What's going on with the present elections, you'll excuse me if I, don't, uh, if I don't go into that, but that's enough to drive anybody crazy, okay? <laughs> in terms of the polarization and in terms of the mud being slung from each side to the other side and the, and the poor level of the, both candidates, you'll excuse me. So, um, listen, good people have to go into politics. That, that's, that's a problem that every country faces. And we don't see it happening as much as it should. Okay, thank you. Some people are wondering about the beginnings. Um, like, what were your first thoughts to start the project? Like, what was in the beginning? Beginning of what? Hunting, <laughs> hunting Nazis, I guess. <laughs> I explained to you how, how I, the beginning. I told the whole story, no? Yes, uh, I think so. For, Maybe for so. through that part. <laughs> Where were you at the time? That is the part that I didn't. Where was I at the time of what? Um, that you started hunting Nazis. Were you I, in, I in America Israel. or? I, I, I was in Israel already. No, listen, I made Aliyah at age 22 after finishing my BA in Yeshiva University. And having spent the year, my junior year in Israel at Hebrew University, I decided Israel was the place for me. I wanted to live in a Jewish country, and I made Aliyah 22. And I've been in Israel ever since, with the exception of two years I spent in L.A., from 78 to 80, when I was collecting material for my doctorate on the Shoah. And uh, at the same time, I was working, I, I got a job working, I was the first like academic director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. That's when, when I first started getting involved in, in Nazis with the U.S. authorities. 
Great. And you already gave us a lot of recommendations about books. Um, people are wondering if you have any other book or film that you would like us to watch. Okay. First of all, if you're interested in, book, in a book on Nazi hunting, and actually my story, there's a book called Operation Last Chance. Operation Last Chance, One Man's Quest to Bring Nazi Criminals to Justice. That, that tell, basically tells my story. And it's available in hardcover and paperback and uh, it's come out in nine different languages already, but not in Spanish. <laughs> not yet. As, as a matter of fact, I don't have a single book out in Spanish. <laughs> if you anyone knows how to get me a Spanish publisher for the book on Lithuania, I'll be very ha happy to get that help. <laughs> You will have a lot of people in Argentina wanting to read your book in Spanish, I'm sure. Okay, well, well the Operation Last Chance book, which uh, was in nine languages already. Oh, here we have the, the link in the chat. So guys, um, I think we have uh, done a lot of questions today. Can, yeah. I, can I ask a last question, sorry? Okay, the last one. The last one. Hi, Efren, thank you for all the work you have done, first of all. It's a pleasure to talk to you today. And I have a question. Uh, do you think if we had internet and social media back then, by the time we had the Holocaust, we would have, uh, have had the same uh, disclosure? Do you think something different could have happened if people all over the world could see what was going on uh, what do you think would, could be different if we had the technology the technology we had we have today by that time okay very interesting question very interesting question i have my doubts and i'll tell you why when the camps concentration camps were liberated um and after the scenes that were f the media was full of the scenes of the terrible atrocities carried out by the Nazis. So the phrase never again was coined, right? It's a very famous phrase, right? Never again, never again to show up. So I, I would say to you that I think the people who say that meant it, but the phrase itself is totally empty because there've been so many, uh, there hasn't been a Shoah, thank God, but there've been so many tragedies afterwards, Biafra, Cambodia, Rwanda, Darfur, uh, Bosnia, you name it, right? So listen, look what happened in Yugoslavia. Look what happened in, in what's happened to the Rohingya in, in Myanmar. There's internet. You can see a lot of the information. Does anyone care? This, this is the problem. The, the UN, which was the United Nations, which was created in the wake of World War II, is, is totally worthless. Totally worthless. And uh, it's turned into basically a forum for attacking Israel in many respects. So they might be doing some good work helping refugees here, helping refugees there, but they haven't prevented really large scale massacres. That, that's what's very discouraging, I have to say. So, you know, um, the, the, and, and what makes it even worse is because all this is happening after the Shoah. People know what the Shoah is and what happened. When the Shoah took place, there was no such thing and people probably wouldn't have even believed it. And as a matter of fact, I'll tell you, one of the things that I wrote about in my research as a, as a uh, you know, scholar of the Holocaust, I wrote about the whole issue of knowledge of the crimes. When did the Jews in America find out? What did they know when? And you know what, Professor Bauer, Yehuda Bauer, is probably the most important Holocaust historian today in the world. He, he was my teacher and my um, you know, a PhD advisor. And my, you know, he was the mentor for, for my PhD. And he writes that there's a very important difference between knowledge and internalization of knowledge. In other words, you might know some facts, but in order for you to act, to do something about them, you have to internalize the information. And the gap between knowledge and internalization is the critical problem 
in getting people to try and fight against injustice. Thank you very much. That's so true. Unfortunately, it's true. You're right. You're right. It's very sad. Very sad. But that's why we're working so hard. Having said that, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of research that shows that Holocaust education is very helpful in fighting against anti-Semitism, in fighting for tolerance, fighting for acceptance of the other, things like this, and important things that, um, you know, make the world a better place. So I don't want to discourage anybody. Uh, it's very important to really to, to join the efforts being made to fight against anti-Semitism, to fight for greater tolerance, to fight for a better world. Simon Wiesenthal himself said that freedom and democracy are, you have to fight for them every day. And there was in the battle, you see it. You see the rise of dictatorships in the world. You see the uh, regimes which have no respect for human rights. And they are very determined. And in order to defeat a determined enemy, you have to be just as determined or more determined. And this is why, for example, for me, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I sometimes think about the European Union and what, what, uh, to what degree would they, would they, for example, fight against the Russian invasion of Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and all these countries? I, you know what I mean? I'm not even sure they would even put up a fight. It's like people, people in Europe, you, you have to be dedicated and devoted to ideals. Freedom is one of them. Democracy is one of them. The Jewish people is one of them. And, and, and this is something that has to be strong enough to motivate you not only to, to sitting and reading a book or watching a TV show, but being out there to fight, whether it's a demonstration or to work in a, in a cause and, and all sorts of different things that, that we do. On that note, I want to thank you so much for your time. As I said in the beginning, you are famous. We've seen you on TV and all, but having you here and making you like all these questions and having the answer in real life, this is amazing. So this is a great opportunity. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for the opportunity and good luck to everybody. Make good shidduchim over there and uh, good Jewish families. <laughs> <laughs>